Brothers and sisters in Christ, welcome to this Monday Thursday evening service. I'm Rev. Sid King Tat. I will be sharing this evening's meditation.
The scripture reading this evening is taken from 1 Corinthians 11 and verses 23 to 26. Let us read this portion of scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thanks be to God. This is the title of my sermon this evening. This cup is the new covenant. What does Monday Thursday mean? What are we remembering on Monday Thursday? On Monday Thursday, we commemorate Christ's mandate. Monday being a shortened form of the Latin word mandatum, which means command. It was on the Thursday of Christ's final week before being crucified and resurrected that he said this commandment to his disciples. Jesus and his disciples had just shared what was known as the Last Supper and he was washing their feet when he stated, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. These words of Jesus is recorded for us in the Gospel of John, chapter 13 and verse 34. In the Gospel's account of Jesus' Last Supper with the disciples, the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke records for us Jesus celebrating the Jewish Passover meal with his disciples on the Thursday evening. In the Gospel of John, however, the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples was described as an evening meal before the Passover feast. Biblical scholars had therefore argued over whether Jesus' Last Supper was in fact a Passover meal or simply an evening meal. In any case, the picture formed for us when we looked at both accounts of Jesus' Last Supper as recorded in the Synoptic Gospels and in the Gospel of John, is one that clearly reveals that Jesus, in establishing the New Covenant at his Last Supper, gave his disciples both a new sacrament, which is the Eucharist, or the Holy Communion, and a new commandment to love one another. In the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus, in celebrating the Passover feast, with his disciples for the last time before his death, appropriated the Jewish Passover meal and reconstituted it to commemorate his own death on the cross. Jesus' death on the cross was to be a sacrificial atonement for the sin of mankind, so that man need not have to face the wrath of God against sin. Jesus gave the bread of the Passover meal, a new meaning. Jesus said, This is my body given for you. To point to his own body to be laid down and hanged on the cross. Jesus used the wine cup of the Passover meal to signify his blood to be shed on the cross. Jesus, lifting up the wine cup of the Passover meal, said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you. In the Gospel of John, at the Last Supper, Jesus enacted the new commandment by washing the disciples' feet as he gave them his new commandment to love one another. This is recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, 34 to 35. At the Last Supper, Jesus declared to his disciples the new covenant that God was inaugurating and establishing with God's people. 
this new covenant is to be commemorated by his disciples through the Holy Communion celebration. The point is to the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross on Good Friday. The blessings of the new commandment experienced through the sacrificial love of God in Jesus is to be lived out by the disciples by keeping the new commandment to love one another. But even as we speak of the new covenant, it presumes that there must be an old covenant. The new covenant must be seen with reference to the old covenant. The Passover feast was a key celebration of God's old covenant. It commemorates the deliverance of Israel from bondage in Egypt under Pharaoh. It was an inaugural event, a beginning where God calls Israel out to be a nation of God's people, and God himself promising Israel that he will be their God. But the Old Covenant, with this beginning marked by the Passover event, together with the giving of the law of Moses by God, or the Torah, to Israel at Mount Sinai, was an incomplete covenant. In God's redemptive plan, the Old Covenant was only a temporary arrangement. God had in mind another more superior covenant to be put in place at the right time to complete God's redemptive plan for mankind. This new covenant was inaugurated and established by Jesus by his death on the cross. Why is there a need for our new covenant? In what ways? Was the Old Covenant inadequate compared to the New Covenant? This is what St. Paul says about our Old Covenant in Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 7 to 13. Let me read. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 7 to 13. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. This is what Paul says in Hebrews. The old covenant was inferior and incomplete in that it only provided a temporary cleansing of sin through the annual sin offering of the blood of animals for the atonement of sin of the people by the high priests in the temple. This annual sin offerings was provided for in the law of Moses. However, notice this, that a Passover feast, though a very important ceremony, only commemorates the deliverance by God of Israel from the oppression of Pharaoh. It has nothing to do with the cleansing of sin. With the destruction of the temple of God in Jerusalem, the high priests could not make the annual sin offerings of animals. And so the cleansing for the sin of the nation and acceptance by God could not be fulfilled by the Old Covenant. Therefore, the Old Covenant was inferior, incomplete and inadequate. The Old Covenant had to look forward to the New Covenant to deal with finality, 
the sin issue and the judgment of God against sin. The demands of the law of Moses concerning sin under the Old Covenant had to look forward to Jesus Christ to fulfill its demands by dying on the cross as a ransom and atonement for mankind's sin. And so it is that at the Last Supper, the Thursday evening before his death, that Jesus declared and announced to his disciples the framework of the new covenant with its new sacrament, the Eucharist or the Holy Communion, and the new commandment that points to the cross that Jesus would take up to fulfill the demands of the law under the old covenant. This new covenant is one that is far superior, more complete, and a permanent resolution of the sin issue of humanity. At the Last Supper, when Jesus lifted up the wine cup and made available the cup of the new covenant to his disciples to drink, there were two other cups that Jesus had to drink. These were the cup of suffering and the cup of God's wrath. If Jesus had not taken upon himself to drink the cup of suffering and the cup of God's wrath, then the cup of the new covenant would not have been made available for us today, for the church to participate in. What then is the cup of suffering and the cup of God's wrath? What is the cup of suffering? Immediately after the Last Supper, Jesus with his disciples went to a nearby grove of olive trees, the Garden of Gethsemane. All three synoptic Gospels records for us Jesus' agony as he went off to pray by himself while his disciples slept in spite of Jesus inviting them to pray with him. Jesus was in agony as he faced the prospect of being arrested by the Jewish religious leaders and be put to death on the cross. In Matthew 26, 38-39, it tells us there that Jesus' soul was overwhelmed with sorrow. Let me read Matthew 26, and verses 38-39. to Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. In Luke's account in Luke 22 and verse 44, it is said that Jesus was in such anguish that he, as he prayed, his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Why was Jesus in such agony? We only need to look at his prayer to God the Father. He prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus was in agony and wished that the cup, the cup of suffering that Jesus was soon to experience in the hands of the Jewish religious leaders and Roman authorities, because he was about to be tortured and put to a cruel death on the cross. Could all this be taken away from him? But Jesus was very clear about his mission and was obedient to that mission. He wants God's will to be done rather than his, than his will to be fulfilled. Jesus accepted willingly and drank the cup of suffering that God the Father has for Jesus. There is still another cup, the cup of God's wrath that Jesus must face and drink up. In the Old Testament, the judgment of God on the wicked is often described as the cup of God's wrath. 
For example, in Isaiah, God's judgment against Jerusalem for her disobedience is described as the cup of his wrath. Let me read from Isaiah 51 and verse 17. Awake, awake, rise up, Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, you who have drained to its dreads the goblet that makes people stagger. In Jeremiah, the judgment of God against Israel's enemies is described as a cup filled with the wine of God's wrath. Jeremiah 25 verse 15 says this, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take my hand, take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath, and make all the nations to whom I sent you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. Similarly, in Revelation, the final judgment of God against the wicked and rebellious is described as the cup of wrath of God. In Revelation 10 and verses 9 to 10, it says there, A third angel followed them and said in a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives its mark on their forehead or their, on their hand, they too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will, will, they will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. Finally, Jesus on the cross took the cup of wrath of God and drank it himself on our behalf. In Matthew 27 and Mark 15, it's recorded that Jesus hang on the cross as he gave up his last breath. He cried out, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? God makes it clear in his word that he has only one answer to every human need. His Son, Jesus Christ. In all His dealings with us, He works by taking us out of the way and substituting Christ in our place. The Son of God died instead of us for our forgiveness. He Himself took the cup of suffering and the cup of God's wrath. He rose from the dead and He wants to live in us for our deliverance from sin that we may share in the cup of the new covenant. So we can speak of two substitutions, a substitute on the cross who secures our forgiveness and a substitute within each one of us who secures our victory over sin. It will help us greatly and save us from much confusion if we keep constantly before us this fact, that God will, all, will answer all our questions in one way only, namely, by showing us more of His Son. His Son who took the cup of suffering and the cup of wrath on our behalf, so that we may share in the cup of the new covenant. How then shall we respond to this costly grace of God that has been given to us by Jesus. How then shall we respond indeed? So in ending, let me give first a warning. The warning is this, let us not, deliberate, let us not deliberately keep on sinning. For in Hebrews 10 and verse 26 to 29, the letter writer of Hebrews tells us this. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. 
Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled on the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. So let this be a reminder that we should not keep on sinning deliberately because God's wrath is fearful indeed. And we need not face God's wrath because He has given us His Son. He has invited us to be in the new covenant covenant of peace. Let us be, remember this encouragement that we must keep our faith and run the race. As the letter, as the writer of the Hebrews in chapter 12 and verse 1 to 2 says this, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So in closing, remember this warning. Let us not deliberately keep on sinning. An encouragement. In spite of everything, keep the faith. Run the race. And at this time, when we are facing this COVID-19 pandemic, let us keep our faith and run the race. Let us not be discouraged. Let us know that the costly grace of God by the giving of His Son has sealed us all in the new covenant. And let us continue to remember through the Holy Communion Sacrament what Christ has done for us on the cross. And let us lift out this new covenant through Christ that has been given in us the Holy Spirit to enable us to live out the new commandment, to love one another, to love others. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, at this time when we are confined to our homes and you have put a pause to all our running about and business of life, help us to be quiet so that we may know your costly grace of the giving of your Son, given to us so freely and unconditionally. Help us not to be anxious about the COVID-19 pandemic, but instead to rest in your shalom peace made available to us in your new covenant of love. In the name of Jesus Christ, Amen.